Welcome to Education Talks, I'm David Burke. This man performed in the opening ceremony of the London 2012 Olympics. He also just so happens to be an experienced educator. Stephen Cook is the Director of Skits and Overseas Programs at the University of Buckingham. Having met him recently at the BET conference in Bangkok, I knew he'd be a great guest to have on Education Talks. Well, Stephen Cook, uh, welcome to Education Talks. Hello, David. It's uh, great to have you here. And uh, where are you joining us from? So I'm at, I'm at home, and home is in South Essex in the UK, which is about, well, let's say, 40 miles east of London. Fantastic. Well, I'm, as you can see, in uh, Singapore. I'm just sitting down here on the... Uh, Shores of Marina Bay. I can uh, see, Cal- yeah. It look, looks wonderful. No wind or anything. Wow. Yes, as still as anything. It's like glass, <laughs> the water out there. But um, no, if you can hear any noise in the background, I apologise. Um, where I'm staying, there's uh, some construction going on. It's been going on from the early hours of the morning, and it's uh, now 5.30 in the uh, late afternoon, and they're still going so on a Friday, which is uh, <laughs> dedication. Um well, look, thanks very much for uh, joining us. So can you tell us a little bit, bit about your current role and uh, and what are skits? Okay, so my my title is Senior Tutor and Director of Skits and Overseas Programs at the University of Buckingham in the Faculty of Education. Um, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful university, the first private university ever in the UK. Um, we are... 50 years old next year um so and also 40 years old. so we were set up in 1973 became officially university in 1983 um so what do i do in my job so mainly i work in teacher training um working on our pgce pgc with qts programs um i also yeah i'm director of skits now skits is spelled s-c-i-t-t-s and that stands for school centered initial teacher training. And in the UK, this, this is where um, schools themselves will do the, the training of the teachers in, in school um, uh, to get the um, QTS, qualified teacher status, which is awarded by the, uh, the DV, the, the government in the UK. And what a lot of these skits do is work alongside universities as partners because the university can award a, an academic qualification the pgce the postgraduate certificate of education um so my job there is to well, I, the skits are clients um you know for, for us so it's about building relationships partnerships and working you know closely with them so that they are they know what they're doing and um, and it all works smoothly so i very much enjoy enjoy that i really enjoy partnership working and director of overseas programs kind of anything really overseas um we met of course in uh, bangkok at a conference um we've got a program in mexico for example where the Me- the the mexican team deliver our pgce in country and that's been going before i joined the university and that's really successful to the point where the mexican government have uh, acknowledged our um that 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 qualification um which is a big a big step and so I'm trying to set more of these pro, more of these kind of projects up, really. Um, so I've been in talks this week with a, with a number of other kind of countries, um, and also to kind of you know sell our, our masters programs that are very reasonable. I think probably David, when we met, I gave you um, one of our um, brochures and said, "Well, why don't you come and study with us?" Um, <laughs> <laughs> ever the salesman. Um, so yeah, that, so that that's my job, and I, I have to say, um, because it allows me to travel, um, and 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 I just love different cultures and working with different people, partnerships. You know, I really think I've kind of got the best job in the world for me. You know, it, it, it wouldn't suit everybody, but you know, I'm very very happy to be um, to have got this job. Well, maybe not everybody, but I think a lot of people would uh, think that sounds like an exciting job. But what is it that you're doing now that really excites you? So, yes, I mean, this week's a great example. So having discussions with um, with a school group from Pakistan, for example, um, because what we can do is we can because we've got the Mexican model, we can we can adapt how we how we like deliver or run or, um, or yeah, deliver and run the, the programs. I've spoken to another um, group um, in, in, in another 
um, in a Middle Eastern country. I, I don't want to say too much, you see, in case, in case you know, something doesn't happen. But that really is the stuff that that excites me. Um, writing to people, I had a, had a great chat with the skit this week as well um, to see if they'd like to partner with us. Anything that kind of, yeah, anything partnership working and that I can drive forward business. I have to say that's the that's the thing that that really excites me. And the other side of it is going into the classroom and seeing my trainees. I've got two trainees this year and I've not yet been in the classroom to see them, but just something about going into schools and, and um, you know, doing some observations and, and helping and guiding them as, as you know, as, as, as early career practitioners. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. So you have this fantastic uh, roles, very exciting working around the globe, but can you take us back to, the beginning of your career and, uh, you know, beginning a career in education, how did it all start? Well, I always wanted to, I always thought I'd be a teacher and that's kind of come from the, I just loved school. I, I worked it out quite early on really that, you know, you're going into this place, you're with your mates, you're laughing pretty much all day. You're getting this free stuff that goes into your head. I mean, obviously you through taxation and, and your parents, but I kind of worked it out quite quickly that this was a this is a great deal, you know. And I know and, and I know that that school can be really tough for so many young people, you know. I just maybe I just had so you know I was very really fortunate, but also I also think that even kids who don't have like difficult times of bullying, whatever it is, still don't necessarily have worked it out until they're much later in life and go, oh yeah, now I realise are the best years of my life. I kind of knew then, and I suppose as you got as I got older, building those really decent relationships with, with the teachers. And I, and so I thought, oh, I think I might be, when I got to six and I thought that this could be something for me. So I went to university um, and actually did a degree. My degree was geography um, in with, with the, with it, with the view that I probably would become a teacher. So out of my three A-levels that I took, which were maths, economics, and geography, I thought, well, there's no way I'm going to do a degree in maths because I'd, I'd really struggled at A-level. And, and maths, are, when you get to A-level, it just becomes letters. Um, but I was really good at the other stuff. And then economics isn't on the national curriculum in England. So that would actually have reduced my job chances. So I plumped for geography, actually. Um, so that was quite a wise thing, in a way. Um, so then I graduated in 1995. I know I look much younger. No, I know I don't look much younger. Um, <laughs> But I also then didn't want to go straight into the classroom because I didn't want to be 21, 22, kind of enjoying, you know, being in the classroom and then thinking what else is out there. So my intention in 95 really was, right, I, need, I want to get a job in London. Now, I didn't know what that looked like, what it was, but it was just like, let's get a job in London. Um, I live in a commuter belt, so kind of everyone commutes into London, right? And, of course, as most things in life... Um, it's not who it's not what you know it's who you know and my cousin worked for ITV which is a an independent tv company it's, the, it's the, a massive company in england and this was before the days of sky um or where you're from david like optus and sky and all that yep. kind of thing you know yep. um and uh yeah on a second interview i got a job at ITV so i was in advertising sales for 4 years um before getting a big, big bonus, 55% of my annual salary I got in 1998. Wow. And then I resigned the next day and went traveling for a year um, <laughs> because that's what you do. And I was 24 and, and, but then I'd, I'd but then I'd already got my place at, at, at university of Leeds to do my teacher training. So that was there. So well, whereas I thought I might do one or two years in, in London ended up as four <laughs> and then went traveling for a year. So 1999, last century, oh, kills me. Um, I started my PGCE in geography in um, in in Yorkshire, in in Leeds. Um, so that was an interesting that was an interesting uh, experience because I, the two schools that I did my placement in were so totally different. Um, one of them was uh, was a uh, um, in an affluent area and had quite good results and, you know, quite well behaved young people. The, the other school, I'll, I'll explain it by percentage is 
of of grades. I don't like doing that, but the first one I, I was in was got eight. The, the, the students in year eleven got eighty percent of them were getting five or more A to C grades in their GCSEs. In the second one I went to, thirteen one three percent of getting these grades, and because I look like Stone Cold Steve Austin, apparently he was a wrestler. I don't know if you're aware. I mean, I, would, I don't really know this guy. But these these Asian lads I noticed really loved the wrestling and they just kept calling me Stone Cold Steve Austin everywhere I went. And it was a tough place to teach, you know. But they did say if you could teach here, you could teach anywhere. And, um, well, I, you know, I, I, I got through it. And then I moved back to South End um, in Essex and took up my first post was at an all-girls grammar school. Um, and so that was 2000 to 2003. And then I moved on to another local school that wasn't a grammar school. It was a head of year. That was my kind of middle leadership. And then in 2008, um, I took up a senior leadership post at a, a secondary school in, in South End. Um, and I did 10 years full time teaching before I then um, left full time and kind of started my work freelancing as a consultant and, uh, and stuff. So that, that takes me to 2010. And your question was, how did you start? So is that is that the end of that question, or do you want more? No, that's that's great. It gives us a bit of, uh, I guess, uh, I, a bit of background on the, your varied experiences. Um, now, you mentioned that we met in uh, Bangkok at the BET conference, um, and uh, you were telling me a lot about your experience in Australia, including a visit to my hometown, Wollongong. You, you've been there. That's right. Um, can, can you share with us um, sort of where you've lived in your life and, and how this has shaped the person that you are today? So I love traveling, but I hadn't, I didn't start traveling until, you know, I've got that bonus from, from, from my work at ITV. So I wouldn't say I'd lived, but I did spend six months in Sydney, but my initial, so my travel really, my, my early travels were, I did a whole two months across America and then I spent a couple of weeks in Fiji. But interestingly, I've just done a, a lecture for our trainees. Well, it wasn't a lecture. It was more an introduction to the day where I talked about all the different schools I've been to and mm -hmm. what I learned from those experiences. And, and the first one was like Fiji. So that was one of my destinations. Mm -hmm. And that was a wonderful um, that they could all sing in harmony, kind of weirdly. And, mm -hmm. and in this, this school, they were telling me on an island the high attainers went off to university, but those who, who, who didn't, they learned a trade for the local community. It was almost like a perfect, you know, yeah, Nirvana of ed where education fits in with the local community. It was, it was amazing. Um, then spent a month in New Zealand. I didn't do anything particularly um, educational there. And of course, this was before I was a teacher, but mm -hmm. I did have the, the best month ever in, in New Zealand, just traveling around. It's the most beautiful place. Got to Sydney and half of me wished I kind of had been like qualified as a teacher because then I could have got quite a decent job. So I lived in Sydney for about five months and I was knocking on doors trying to sell a Optus, the 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 kind of the virgin equivalent, I suppose, in the UK. Um, and then just travelled around all around Australia. I went to Zimbabwe and uh, South Africa. More travelling, but then subsequently. Um, my wife and I moved to Sierra Leone in 2013, 14. And I took up a kind of a headship, a very small football academy um, in Sierra Leone. It had been kind of funded by uh, a Premier League football um, player. Um, and that, you know, that kind of experience is quite profound. Um, things didn't go as well as we'd, we'd hoped. We, we, we weren't there after the first year, but the, it it taught me it, it showed me that student motivation is so so important because the these got these boys that we had wanted to learn and out of 15 entries of IGCSE 14 of them were sere above and this is without qualified teachers apart from myself and my wife um and very little in terms of resources and that was a bit you know so I was very proud of those achievements it wasn't easy necessarily living in Sierra Leone um but uh yeah, that was, yeah, it was quite, well, it was very, very interesting. And even though things didn't work out necessarily as, as we'd hoped, we're both now in, in positions and jobs that I don't necessarily think we would have been if we hadn't have gone and done that. So you should never look back. You should always look look, look forward. 
So this shaped a sort of international person that you become. And, uh, you know, the biggest international event in the world is probably, if not the Football World Cup, then the Olympics. <laughs> and uh, the London Olympics were very memorable. And, you know, London almost in the same league as Sydney 2000, I might say. You know, not, not a bad Olympics, pretty good. Almost. Um, <laughs> yeah, almost, almost. I mean, Sydney, come on, best, best ever. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, you had the chance of a lifetime uh, to, to be involved in the opening ceremony. Can you tell us how this came about? Well, um, I can tell you how this came about. First of all, I also did the great stadium walk in Sydney before the Olympics. And I, I was brought up, my dad was an athlete when he was younger. And um, so we always watched the, you know, the athletics and the Olympics was always a massive, a massive part of, of our kind of lives. Um, if you will if you'll indulge me, uh, basically my story about getting to the univ- to to the um, London Olympics and performing goes right back to when I was um, when I was a student. So when I got when I hit the sixth form at school, so this we're talking about eighty nine ninety. Um, I was very much just a, a kind of a football tennis. I was a I was a jock, I suppose you, you you'd say. I just pl- played sport. And I knew I was absolutely rubbish at anything creative. I mean, anything like art, pottery. I've, I've got really warm hands. So when they, when the, when the art teacher gave me some clay, I, the, the first time we ever did pottery, I remember just like needing this kind of like you know, a pot, and it started to crack. And the teacher, honestly, he couldn't believe it. He said, "Well, how's that? Maybe you dried it out." I've got some really weird warm hands. Art, anything, creative, yeah, anything. I was just terrible at. But I didn't realise I ha- I'd kind of didn't have this kind of creative, um, you know, I didn't know it was missing. And then one day, a teacher called Jerry Dale said to me and my mate, he said, boys, do you want to be in the school play? We're doing Joseph and his Technicolor dream coat. And we looked at each other initially and just, well, I don't think so, Jerry. Well, it didn't say Jerry, but Mr. Dale. Um, but we thought about it. thought, well, what, why not? You know, we're in the sixth form now. We're, we're not part of a massive group of 300. We're... There's not many of us, actually. Mm-hmm. It's the start of a bit of fame, you know, kind of or infamy in school, you know, and you hit the sixth form and suddenly, you know, suddenly you're walking around in jeans or whatever. So we thought, OK, why don't we give this a go? And that, David, is the thing that absolutely changed my, my life. Um, mm-hmm. Went to the rehearsals. I was one of the brothers. So I was my mate. Um, and we're going through the, the songs. And I, I realised that I could sing. Or rather, he realised and then, then he'd say, come, come over here, boys. And we'd be by, by the piano and he'd say, sing this. And he'd, he'd sing a harmony line. And I, and I could do it. And I could, could do it quite easily. And um, so I suppose there's, there was that kind of, I suppose, some kind of, you know, innate something within me that meant I could do that. But it, was, it had to be unlocked, you see. Mm. And then, then Jerry, and we did the play. It was amazing. Jer- Jerry then introduced me to kind of the, the music teachers um, Pauline Waller. So I do want to call. I do want to call these people out because they had such a massive impact on my life. So she was the music teacher. And her husband was the drum teacher because there was a drum kit, and I'd never played the drums, but I used to just stand over this drum kit and just think, "Oh my goodness, I would love to be able to play those drums." So they said, you know, they saw me like pining after this kit and said, "Would well, you want lessons?" So I asked my parents, and um, I'm not from a particularly wealthy background at all. Um, and so it was, a, you know, they said, well, you know, we'll find some money for you to go and do that. And that's it. I mean, that that was my that was my take off. That's the thing that changed, changed my life. Those, those three people had such a massive impact. And when I tell this story to, to trainees, you see, the point about this story is, is that as teachers, you can have a profound effect on someone's life and maybe not even know that you have. Mm. But those 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 eight words, I think it is, you know, do you want to be in the school play had a massive mm. profound impact on my life. So when I tell trainees this story, I say cut a long story short, you know, from 1990 to 2012 and the London Olympics was in town and it was going to be 40, 35 miles from my house. And I thought I've got to be part of it. Whatever happens, I've got to be part of it. So I, I, I just went online, found the, um, you know, applied to be a performer in the opening ceremony Went along in November 2011, I think it was, for these open auditions. Kind of weird things. You had to like walk in a walk in a in a row. You know, can you know? Can you walk 
behind someone else um, and then do all this kind of actions. And the thing they got us to do was oh, there's a lot of mime. And I know now that that was in the opening part of the ceremony that I was in as well, where you've got all these industrial revolution workers doing all these kind of movements. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the first audition, they said, if you've got any skills, like if you can play the drums, go and sign up. So I went over and, and they said, uh, okay, how long have you been playing the drums? And I said, 24 years or whatever it was then. And they were, oh, okay. And then I got a call back for the audition for drummers. And what was interesting about that was that not, not everyone was a drummer at all. In fact, I'd, I'd say the majority of those people that were drummers in the opening ceremony weren't drummers. But a few of them would actually say, the only reason we got to do it is because we hung around with you, Steve. Because what was happening is in these exercises we had to do, let's say there, there was a click track going, like a metronome, and then it would cut out. So, you know, you've got to keep the beats. That was the whole point. And a lot of these people were like just hanging around me to see what I was doing to follow me. Um, you know, not to be big headed, but you know, that's what they said. And so, yeah, we got to do we got to do that. And it was well, it was just a fan, just an absolutely fantastic. What a life experience to be part of the, you know, opening ceremony. And then we became part of the closing ceremony. So I was actually in the stadium for that night. And that was my birthday as well. So that was my wow. 39th birthday, um, I think. Yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, it was just absolutely brilliant. But, you know, like I said, the key thing about that is it was all, you know, I don't think that would have happened if I'd have uh, not had, had, had been taught and had the, you know, the privilege really I've been taught by um, Jerry and, and Pauline and, and Colin as well. I imagine that would be something they'd be proud of. Now, what would you say for you in your career, in your teaching career, what has been the most rewarding uh, part of it for you? I think uh, I say I say to young young teachers that, that you know I don't think you know the best things about your career yet, and they look at me a bit odd, you know, because I say, "What what would you enjoy doing?" And um, they don't, they don't. But actually, you know, the things that I that I love are seeing ex students, you know, grown up and and making a success in the world, and and um, I think that's that. I think that, that, that that's the that's the joyous thing that. I might have had an impact because that's what you go into this for. You don't go into education for the money. I mean, you'd be a madman to go and do that. <laughs> so it's about having an impact on others. And I, and I, I, I hope I have. And a lot of my ex students want to be in contact with me. They, they, they want to be a friend on Facebook. Um, you know, it's a great joy that I can, like I messaged yesterday, a young man I used to teach, who's a plumber, just said, Hey, <laughs> Hey, hey, Matt, can you, can you come round and sort my, and he, and he does, you know, and then I said, Oh, do you know a Sparky? I need a Sparky. Um, so mm -hmm. I just think that, that the whole endeavor of, of it's not just about teaching. It's about relationships. It's about building people up and, and yeah. So my, my great joys and the things I'm most proud of are relationships maybe that I've, I've made. Um, of course you want to see students do well. I mean, in 2003, one of my students, I got a letter to say that they'd they'd got top ten in the country in their exams, and yeah, okay, that's that's a that's a good thing. But that's not the first thing that springs to my mind that that that, that happened. Um, ultimately, when something like that happens, I just think, well, they just listened more than others. Do you know what I mean? You know, everybody in that class got the same teaching. What was it about them that made them get top ten? I just think that they may have listened more. I think the challenge in teaching, really, the challenge in teaching is that you don't become so boring that they don't listen to you anymore, that there's enough variety in what you're doing, that you, that they, and their relationship is there, that they want to be in that classroom with you. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very long answer to, to that question, but I think probably that you'll see a thread through this really, which is about relationships and, yeah. um, and, and, and how important they are. So the, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of, proud of many things, but you know, yeah, student successes, but what they become. Outstanding. Now, whilst reflecting on your career, um, what do you think about the state of education today? Have you got any thoughts? <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> okay. So I think for a long time I've, I've questioned, and this is, of course, a personal opinion. I think I've questioned what schools are there for. I and passionate about the fact that I think schools are about getting young people ready for life. 
And I don't think that is what governments think. I don't think that's necessarily what some people in education think. Because I think a lot of people in education think schools are about getting the best exam results because they see that that, that will then lead on to, you know, things like social mobility. But the reality is, is that not, not every child is academic. And I think it's, I think it's, it's wrong. Or I don't think it's right necessarily that, that, that kids leave school with just one piece of paper that says, this is the amount of knowledge I know in all these different subjects. Um, I don't have an answer necessarily, but certainly, you know, skills, dispositions, we know that the grades will only get them to an interview, right? You know, you'll get to interview for a college or you get it to an, in, to an actual job interview with your grades. They, it doesn't get you the job. And it's the stuff after that. And I think that it's just questioning the hierarchy of subjects. I mean, you know, kind of paraphrasing Sir Ken Robinson's, you know, legendary speech. Mm. And that had, a, that had a massive impact on me as well, mm. just to start thinking about this stuff. You know, for example, in a, in a school, you know, food technology, as we have it in the UK, the food technology teachers think, think that they're the bottom of the pile. And in some people's perspective, they are, but they shouldn't be because surely teaching young people how to cook for their future families has got to be one of the most important things that we do in schools. So this whole, the hierarchy that what, what is considered more, more important than not, I just think it might need a, I think it need, a, a need, needs a re, a re look at. So I don't think that schools are getting a young people ready for life. My discussions with employers suggest that so in my last role um this is so we're going back to 2009 ish i'd meet with um, local businesses because i knew that there was a i knew that we could work more closely with local businesses um and i've got some really cool projects going actually where the kids were working on real life stuff not just pretend you're a t-shirt factory and make a website they were working on real life stuff and these, these employers, I'd say, you know, if I, if I could change anything within the education system, what would it be? And they said, you know, Steve, these, these young people are coming out of school without the ability to solve a problem. And that's a massive issue. And I think that kind of would be coming out maybe a university as well. And I just saw in my career that education almost becoming a spoon feeding endeavour. Because the kids realised as well the importance of the exam. So kids, rather than going into a classroom and, and oh, you know, what is it we're going to do today? And maybe it's also because because their age, but I just don't see that kind of, you know, what are we doing today? And it's just, mm. it's completely, you know, at, at them. There doesn't seem to be any any excitement within them. As I say, it could be also down to their, um, to their age and, you know, and, and testing them at, at 16, you know, when uh, when sex, drugs, and rock and roll um, becomes on on their agenda. Anyway, you know, I, I, in a long way, but yeah, I, I think we need to re relook at quite a lot of stuff. But you know, essentially, our schools getting young people ready for life, and what life is going to throw them, because climate change and the massive challenges. You know, they're going to be they're going to be work, You know, they're going to be. We need solutions that are that come from our young people where they're solving problems, they're working collaboratively. I don't see much working collaboratively. And when you mention collaborative working mm. you know, and, 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 you know, you dare to do it on Twitter because everyone's like, oh, I'm not doing group work because there's no evidence of group work and, and, you know, that works. And, you know, I didn't like doing group work either, but we need to work out ways that we can do that rather mm. than just saying don't do it because it doesn't work and, and stuff like that in a roundabout way. And the other massive thing is um, critical thinking. And, 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 you know, in the last few years, well, since 2016, the whole Brexit thing and the pandemic, I've just seen so many adults claiming to be critical thinkers when they're far from it, far from it. And, and I think that, you know, we need to make sure that our young people are coming out as critical thinkers are willing to change minds and, and, and look, look for evidence for things. So that, that's, that's, that's why I do a lecture um, in, in introducing more critical thinking into your classroom, because I think these are the big things. So I think that was a big answer. <laughs> well, certainly critical thinking, just the, the whole um, 
digital environment for, for students today, like their lives online and the ability to be able to evaluate and think about things and source, you know, where information is coming from. It's uh, certainly a challenge, certainly for, for adults today. Uh, so our, our students really need that critical thinking ability. Um, Steve, uh, how can people get in touch with you? Well, certainly if people would like to get in touch, um, re business, business opportunities, working with the University of Buckingham, my email address um, will be in the notes, I believe. So yep. stephen.cook at buckingham.ac.uk. Um, we'll also put a link to the web page. Um, and uh, yeah, and anyone wants to get in touch, I'd be very, very interested in speaking to anyone who'd like, uh, like, like us to work with them, yeah. Fantastic. Well, look, uh, Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure, just like it was uh, when we met in Bangkok. Uh, hope we can uh, catch up again soon. I'd love that, David. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me on as well. I feel honoured. If you're in Singapore or planning to be there for the Expo at Edutech Asia on November 9 to 10, please let me know. I'd love to catch up with you. If you enjoyed this episode of Education Talks, please do share with your friends and colleagues. Don't forget to stay subscribed to catch each new episode.